I'm Brad. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I want to wish you uh, a, a happy Thanksgiving, because that's done. Merry Christmas, right? Uh, 28 years ago, um, uh, a friend of mine who was a pastor of the church that I was at asked me whether I would be interested in leaving my business career and uh, becoming a pastor at the church that we were, our family was a part of. And I don't get to do this very often, but that man is in the house today, and you can either boo or cheer, but here's my friend Chuck right here who invited me to do that. Thank you. So this Christmas, we want to look at Christmas through the lens of hope, the idea of hope, of what Jesus brings into our world and the hope that comes in his vapor trail. In 1 Corinthians 13, one of the heroes of the first century, indeed, of our faith as a whole, is a guy named Paul. And he's trying really, really hard to communicate something to some friends in the city of Corinth, the church that he helped start. And uh, it's almost, he just breaks into this, uh, this riff where he talks about love. And uh, if you, you've like, had this read at many weddings, but it's actually not a wedding deal, but it's more reflective of God's love, where he just describes the nature of God's love. And then he finishes that section. We say, hey, there's three incredible gifts that God gives. One of them is love. Another is faith. And he said the third one is hope. Hope. Hope is, uh, I guess you could think of it, there's many ways you could define it, I suppose. But it's, it's, a, it's an optimistic uh, view to the future that one's faith in Jesus brings about starts with faith in the present and brings an optimistic, enthusiastic idea and view of what the future has. Uh, eight years ago, a young couple in our church and our elders uh, had a hope based on faith in Jesus that uh, we would be able to start a new kingdom work, a new church in Old Town Peoria. And it was a hope of something that Jesus would do in that part of our city. Here we were in the north part of the city, all one big city. We care for our city so much and believe what Jesus can do here. And we just saw an opportunity, a hope for uh, Old Town Peoria. And so through some time and thought and preparation, we invited uh, Gavin and Kendall Linderman to leave our church family. They were a pastor couple with us. And to take a group of 20-somethings and do this high-risk, high-courage thing of starting a new work for Jesus in Old Town, Peoria. That was six years ago that that finally came about. Over these last six years, we have seen wonderful things happen here within our own church family and our extended church family in Old Town, Peoria. Uh, and uh, it's just wonderful to see the effects of hope, of hope based on faith in Jesus Christ. So this weekend, I invited Gavin. Gavin, why don't you come on up? Gavin, to come and be with us. Tell us a little bit of the hope that he's discovering in his own soul these last six years, some of the things that Jesus is doing in Old Town Peoria. But more than anything, to point our attention and focus this Christmas to the hope that's found in the person of Jesus. I want to pray for you and uh, then tell us what you have for us. Jesus, I uh, reflect back on these last six, eight, nine years of uh, friendship with Gavin, and I see what you have done in his life, in his soul, and that is really where it starts, for sure. And then flowing from that, the wonderful way that a beacon of hope has arisen in Old Town Peoria, the way that they love that community, the way that they engage the community, and are the representation of you, Jesus, to bring hope to that part of our city. Thank you. We bless you, Jesus. We give you credit for all that you've done and all that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. We know along the way there have been hope-depleting experiences. And those have served to teach and to grow and uh, brings about the bright hope of today. Yeah. And so for this, we're thankful. Now would you give Gavin words and thoughts and ideas and give us hearts and minds to receive from you whatever you would have through him. So thank you again, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I, uh, I want to just, you know, I'm a linguist guy, and, and you guys heard Brad when he said he invited us to leave. 
That's another way of saying that is out counsel in the pastoral world, you know. Uh, no, it was a, it was a blessing, uh, and it was and it was good news for our city uh, when this church body invited us to participate in what God was doing. And what God was doing was already planted in the hearts of Brad and Elfie and myself and my wife. And it was a privilege to be able to go and be that. And I don't know if you've noticed, but this city of ours, Peoria, which you guys are at like the outer edge of, by the way. You're at the end of town. You know that? You know, pioneers over here, okay? It's beautiful. I'm at the south end of town. I'm at City Hall, basically. That's where Axiom's at, if you're not familiar. We're literally at the opposite end of Peoria. But what's so beautiful about that is that what we've created here is this nice Jesus sandwich with Copper Hills at one end and Axiom Church at the other end. And praise God that in between that is the city that God's gifted us together to steward for his glory. And so I couldn't be more thrilled to be a partner with Copper Hills and the work that God's doing in our city. And you should be excited about that. You should be excited about what God's done through this church body and will continue to do. Now, as I was driving in again today, and I can can now say this officially because it happened yesterday as well, I couldn't help but notice and begin to notice every time I come north, West Wing is uniquely backdropped. Does that come with the HOA fee, by the way? It's like not just the mountains, it's you have installed in your backdrop hot air balloons permanently is what I've noticed. And it's beautiful. And if they're not there, a rainbow or something, you know, a falcon, I don't know, you're going to get it. And it happens every time. I don't have that in South Phoenix. So I don't know how we get that, but we should work on it. Um, And so you guys must have a special blessing over here um, that, that I'd like to take back with me if possible. But here's something I did take with me. It was not just the good news of Christ, but a real heart for mission. And when we moved into to eventually what would be Old Town Peoria area, we, f- we found that there was a number of families that have historically existed in the Old Town area that have been there since the beginning, and they carry weight in that neighborhood, and they carry influence. But they also carry a high level of respect and suspicion for the new guys. And as people planting, we wanted to just pray that God would give us favor with them. And so one of the sort of matriarchs of the community, her name, I won't say her name, <laughs> I almost said her name, she has sort of been at a distance Since the conception of Axiom in Old Town specifically, since we've built there, since we've established um, our our venue and coffee shop and all of that, she's kept a distance. I've been unable to sit down with her, connect with her, no matter how hard I've tried. And this last week, a week and a half ago actually now, Axiom Church hosted an Old Town Peoria Thanksgiving feast for the entire neighborhood. And guess who was the first one there? She showed up for the first time. And not only, yeah... And, and not only did she, she show up, she brought a dish with her to share. And what a, it was such a blessing to receive her blessing, to be a pastor, to be a minister in her neighborhood that she's been at her entire life. And, and so there's just really good things happening out of the church planting spirit that is so alive here at Copper Hills and now instilled in our heart. And so while it might have been 26 or however many years ago before I was born when you planted, um, it's, it's, no, I'm kidding. It was, it was nine years ago that the idea first was, came to me that, hey, Gavin, why don't you leave this music world that you've been doing? Not, you know, leave it, leave it, but why don't you try ministering to some people. And Brad invited me to be a minister here at Copper Hills for a a long period of time. And uh, and now I'm still in the city. And so I'm cheerleading here for a minute because uh, I just am celebrating being here. It is Thanksgiving. And with that, sometimes it's good to be able to come home and uh, see the family and be with you guys. And I really feel like it is family. Well, I've been tasked with kicking off this discussion on hope. And my sense is that in order for us to talk appropriately about hope, we need to sort of first visit the space where hope is required, where hope is needed, right? Because often we find ourselves tempted to live anywhere but where hope would be required. We want to live at sort of the top of things. We want to be at, our, at the front end of everything. But I really believe deep in our hearts that that's just not true of what's actually taking place in the room. If we're all honest with ourselves and if we all take the time that I believe is necessary for us to be present with ourselves and with others each day, we might find that living inside of us is, is challenge and difficulty. 
We might find that in our setting and in our communities, as beautiful as they are, there's a lot of hardship and heartache often that takes place. And it's not just unique to us or to West Wing or to you guys. It's, it's unique to everybody. Culturally, and within the church, systemically, we have this issue where we want to sort of avoid the spaces of challenge and we want to live in this sort of narrow window of the illusion of wellness. And, and we see this in all, in just about every, all the mediums of the world communicate that's the space to live in. But in reality, we live somewhere else. And that somewhere else has something that's available to us. And it's this word, this idea of hope. And so I want to take us there today because I know if you're anything like me, I've been living in sort of the spirit of Jonah for a long time. Where God's called me to things and I've been invited to face things and to, to sort of deal with my own crucibles, if you will. And yet there I am wanting to flee them at any opportunity I can. Have you guys ever been in that moment where you just want to pack your bags and go... Has anybody ever thought about that one? <laughs> the silence tells me you all have. And, 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 and if you haven't, you've been tempted to at least to tune out, to unplug, to just step away. And often, sometimes, that's exactly what we need. But to live in the space of always escaping the hardship of life in exchange for a moment on the course or whatever it is that you go to, it's just not real. It might be a good diet, it might be a good rhythm, but it's not real. And what I found in my spirit of Jonah is that I'm always tempted to flee. I'm always first tempted to flee. But even when I'm jumping overboard from the crises of life, what it turns out happens is meeting, meeting me beneath the surface of the sea is a giant whale of more depression, more anxiety, more hardship, more difficulty. Because that's real. And no matter how hard we try to run from it, we have to learn to face it. But here's the thing. Is it's when we learn to face it, to be present to it, that hope shows up. We cannot assume that hope is just sort of a byproduct of sort of um, changing the channel. <laughs> hope is designed for the real person exactly where they are. And so today I want to talk about this idea that if we are going to press into hope, we must first become present to the space where hope is required. That while we might be tempted to go around the storm to escape the thing, Jesus invites us to go through it. And he, and he even is determined to do it with us. So where do we place our hope? Well, Historically, what we've found is that we've often placed our hope in various kinds of movements, sociologically, economically, you know, you, you, just, you just see it in these great sweeps of history. At, at one stage, we move into modernity. We move into the space of reason and intellect and learning that, hey, this is going to be the place where we can put, sort of, have our questions answered and our problems righted and we can, we can fix things. If we can just be rational beings and we can put it together and birthed out of placing our hope on that, you would think would be this new utopian for society. But what we find is that modernity ends up ultimately leading us to a place of world war. It leads us to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Holocaust and all these things that take place. And we just go, what happened? I thought there would be less disease. I thought there'd be less war. I thought there... And, and it's, so it's not just us. It's the whole. And out of modernity, then we start to question that. So we've got to put our hopes somewhere else. So where do we go? Well, eventually we go to this idea of post modernity, postmodernism. And what we find there is that we put our hope not in the authorities, not in the voices that once carried weight, but we put our hope in ourselves. We have the capacity to determine for ourselves what's good or not good. And birthed out of that, we see a wave of mental and emotional disorder. Anxiety and depression and stress and all these things begin to take rise. Religious institutes often are places where we put our hope in and that's, a, that's often a good thing unless it's a space that again is trying to take us away from our problems instead of through them. You know you're in a space of health and the opportunity for hope when someone doesn't try to change the channel on your life. 
when someone invites you to be present to that which is happening in you and instead of turn from it, face it. They don't force you to face it alone. You see, we can't afford to be a church that, have, that denies the darkness that really exists in so many of us. We can't be a church that's afraid of what, what's going on in the interior of our lives. We can't be a community that's unwilling to cross boundaries to meet people who are in desperate need of the love of Jesus. You see, if we choose to avoid the darkness, we might get light, but light without any level of darkness would become just blinding. And that's what I think Paul, by the way, is faced with on the road when he is struck and blind himself. He thinks he's got it all sorted out. He thinks he's avoiding all the problems. And God confronts him in a powerful way. No, Jesus calls us to embrace the storm because the storm will pass. The prophets get this too, that the hardship of faith should not be avoided but embraced. You know, it's really interesting to me that Christ, when he calls his disciples, Andrew and Simon, he doesn't just, um, he actually calls them out of, the, out of their comfort zone. Have you noticed that Andrew and Simon, when, when he calls them, they're fishing, okay? <laughs> they're fishing. They're, they're in their family. It's with their father's boat. And, and they're doing pretty good. Their vocation is going well. But he calls them out of their vocation, out of their family, to pick up their cross and to follow him. He takes them out of calm waters and into the storm. That's where he begins. And so perhaps that thing that we've avoided is the very thing that Jesus invites us into. And I want to assure you, if Christ is inviting you into it, there's hope. Now, I, I know I'm taking you to a dark place. How am I doing for a series on hope, by the way? <laughs> I'm taking us here on purpose. Because it's the space that we need to be familiar with if we're going to experience the whole of transformation. Can you think of a story in scripture of transformation that didn't involve a storm? That didn't involve the real clutches of life. It just didn't happen. It's at the edge of, ending, of the ending. It's in the midst of the crisis. It's in the emptiness of our authorities. It's in the space of lack of security when there's no transactions left to be made to get us out of it. It's at this space that Christ always shows up. The, the prophets, if I could start there, they get Ezekiel. In chapter 2, God invites him to bring a message to the people of Israel. But before he does that, God calls him to partake in something, to consume something, and to eat something. I want to read from that, from Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8. And if you'll just follow along with me here, it's going to come up. Uh, verse 8, chapter 2. Son of man, this is a, vi a voice of God coming to him. Listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in their rebellion. Instead, open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now Jesus is about to uh, give him some food to eat. Give him something to partake in before he is able to go to these people. He has to listen to, to the voice and he has to eat and consume that which God's about to give him. Verse 9. Then I looked and I saw a hand reaching out to me. It held a scroll, which he unrolled, and I saw that both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrow, and pronouncements of doom. Now just pause there. The voice of God comes to Ezekiel, and he offers him this feast. Pronouncements of doom, funeral songs, words of sorrow. This is like... A bad emo song. <laughs> and, and, and he's got to eat it. He's got to take it in. Now, I don't know about you, like, this, this is like eating cranberry sauce on Thanksgiving. I'm not having it. I don't like cranberry sauce. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> this guy over here, you need to stick around for the next service too. Uh, this is, 
this, this is what he's invited to participate in. And this is not the thing that we, we, we would anticipate. But listen to where it takes us next. Verse 11, or 1 of chapter 3. The voice then said to me, Son of man, eat what I'm giving you. Eat this scroll. Then go and give its message to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. Keep going. Verse 3. Fill your stomach with this, he said. And when I ate it, it tasted as honey in my mouth. Now what's so remarkable here in this picture of what we're given here is that Ezekiel is offered something that we would go, no thank you, I don't want anything to do with this. I would rather choose, give me anything else to eat. But he trusts and he presses in, he consumes this. And as he does, what he finds is it's as sweet as honey. And this is so consistent to what Jesus eventually will reveal to us. That the thing that you think is your enemy, the thing that you think you can't face, is the very thing that, that God wants to use to shape and form in you the sweetness of honey. He wants to take you to a place of hope. But it might require going through the storm. Before we can get to the light, we have to go through the darkness. Have you been there? Or maybe you've been there alongside somebody else. Or maybe you're there right now. You know, one of the challenges we have with people that are in crisis, people that are in the dark spaces, we don't always know what to do with them. And when we're in those dark spaces, we don't always know sort of how to be. And I, I'm just curious, have you guys ever gone through something hard, something difficult? And, and as you're there, you're trying to maybe share the burden with someone else. You're trying to tell them, you know, how, how it's going. And they're just sitting there like, yeah, yeah, I, t I totally get it. I, I understand. I know right where you're at. And they give you, you know, two, maybe three pats on the shoulder. You guys ever been there? where you're sitting there and you're, you're bearing your soul and, 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 and it's like nobody really gets you or understands, but they keep trying to reinforce to you that they do understand. <laughs> I, can you tell I've been there before? It's a real space. And I think what's happening there for people is that, that sort of there's this, there's this desire to be present to someone who's in pain, but not really. And so if we can just instead maybe coach them through it, give them some sound advice and pat them on the back, we can purge our conscience just enough to allow it to be without it getting on to us. And so what we do inadvertently, unintentionally, is we avoid the space of pain even with those amongst us. But again, I challenge us to be a church that's in it with each other. And I assure you, there are people in the room today who are in it. I had to learn this the hard way because my, wife, my wife's given birth to three kids, okay? And I was that guy. Every time it was about that time, I would think that she was starting to be a little weird. i say, honey, why, why are you acting like you're in so much pain, you know? Like, what's... What's the big deal? It's just the baby's here and it's going to be here. Like it's going to be it's going to be over with the minutes. It's going to be it's going to be fine. And no matter how hard I tried to coach her through it or tell her it was going to be okay, you know, I to be honest, I just thought she was overreacting. <laughs> I mean, she screamed so loud. <laughs> but see, what I, what I was faced with was, was that I couldn't understand the depth of her anguish and pain of the moment, not just because it wasn't me, but because I was too afraid that if I got any closer than just sort of ignoring the, 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 all that was happening, that I too would be swept into it. And so as I tried to offer her some coaching, it really probably just made it worse. And what I missed was that she was the one offering something to me. Isn't that interesting? That the person on their back, the person in pain, the person in labor, the person that's going through whatever it is that's going, the one that we sort of go out of our way to sort of coach or avoid, they're the very ones who get to bear good news to us. 
She had something to give me, to teach me. Because it's only by being present to it that we can ever get to the space of hope. Otherwise, hope is just an illusion. It's a distant place. And this is why I think historically the church has often just given us good news of hope for life after you die instead of giving you hope for life now while you're alive. And I want to challenge you that Christ's good news comes to both spaces. His good news is no doubt for after we die, but it's, it's, it's for life today. Jesus came to give us hope in all things. And it's that space of sort of being on the side that misses it. It's a space of being on top. It's the space of being sort of privileged that where we often miss what real hope is because we have nothing to hope for. But what I'm trying to tell us is that's not really so because deep behind all that is something much more real happening. And I want to invite us to face it. Howard Thurman says this, Christianity from, that's only from the top of things is often sterile, of little avail. The words become muffled, confused, and vague. Because we need a gospel that's, that's just not good news for later, but that's good news today for those in need of good news now. And I want to say it's only good news if it meets us where we are, not just where we will be. You see, if you've met Jesus, you've met the space I'm talking about. I think we can, in some strange way, get connected to God without going to this space. But to get connected to Jesus requires us to go there because he invites us to pick up our cross. Because he himself starts here. Even the prophets, again, speak to this before it even takes place. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, it tells us how Jesus is to come. And this is what it says. It comes, and he would be despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest grief. And we would turn our backs on him and look the other way, for he was despised and we did not care. Isaiah paints this picture of the coming of Christ, of this person that's going to enter into the world, and he doesn't enter through victory, he enters through pain and sorrow and rejection. He faces in his real life the very real things that we ourselves will face. And at the other side of this picture is the cross. On both sides of Jesus' life is this hard space. And it's because he was willing to go there that we might be able to go there and be victorious too. That's what it means when we sing, he has conquered the grave. It doesn't mean that we avoid our grave, it means that we get to conquer it too. Because of him. Our invitation is to live life and live life to the fullest. And I want to tell you, That it's never by changing the station or the escape plan. It's always by being present in the sacrament of the moment. The space that God has given you to transform you, to shape you, and to make you whole. And Jesus came to meet you there. He tells us in Mark chapter 2 verse 17. When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. See, what Jesus is saying here is that he gets it. He's there. He has come for this moment. And we need to have the kind of braveness required to let down our guards, to be human, to be transparent, to open ourselves up to the hope of Christ for the space in our life that needs it the most. God offers this to you. If we pick back up in Isaiah 53 where we left off, verse four through five, 
Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for, for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He has been beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. What, he, what, what is being shared here with us is that Christ comes in such a way that all the darkness, all the pain, all of what we ourselves get to press into, Christ is able to conquer. He's taken it. And because of that, there's hope. So I want to pray for us as we take this brave stand to be hopeful people, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. So if you would, can I ask, because we're a body, can we just assume that there's, there's pain in the room? Can we just assume that there's hardship in the room? And as a way of, of just greeting each other in love, can we just stretch our hands out as a way of, of holding each other up in prayer? Can we do that as I pray? So together as a body, I wanna pray for us. Lord, we reach out our hands as an expression of love for our brothers and sisters. We reach out our hands as a way of grabbing hold of all that you have given us. Lord, we receive this portion, this offering of yours with great hope and with great anticipation for that which you desire to do. So God, I ask that you meet us in this space, that you meet us on our road, that you meet us here in West Wing as it is in heaven, God, with your good news. And may your transformative, transformative work be poured out on this body. And may your Holy Spirit have its full weight of glory given to this church. Jesus, I ask that you would heal, that you would set free, that you would give us permission to have hope in all that you have promised today not just for tomorrow but today too and Christ I thank you for this body your body which is present here in our city and might we be light in the midst of the darkness in Jesus name amen